Hey guys, I'm Dave and welcome to the Troll Gallery. Today, we're going to build a bar top for this bar. Okay, I wasn't going to do a video on this bar build. I have a huge backlog of work and I didn't want to take the time out of construction to set up the shots and all that stuff that would just slow me down. But the closer I got to building the top, the more I realized how cool it was and I just had to share it. So with that said, let's see how this guy came together. This is the base of the bar. It's basic construction from three quarter inch plywood with one and a half inch by three quarter inch poplar face frame pieces. It's held together with pocket hole joinery and some shelf brackets screwed and glued to the body for support. I built this in three parts just so I could move things around while painting. By the time the base was fully assembled, it was all I could do to scoot it around the shop. This thing has some weight. With the base complete, it's time to start on the top. The top of this bar has three main components. A top, a subtop, and molding. Here, I'm ripping the stock to assemble the subtop. I started with two pieces of red oak and I had marked each face with triangles so I could do some registration magic later. Both boards were ripped down to strips at the table saw. For this piece, I needed three of the strips I'd ripped down. Since I don't have a jointer, yet, I make sure that I flip one piece over to equalize any twist or warp in a board. It's not a great solution, but it works. The third board in this case is again set in place to minimize any warp or twist. Now we can locate the positions for the biscuit joinery. I like to start at least three inches in from the edge and set them about eight inches apart. This provides a lot of alignment and some extra strength along the joint. I set my biscuit joiner to cut at the midpoint of my stock, which here is about seven sixteenths of an inch down from one face, and then I could cut a slot at each alignment point. The key to clean cuts here is to let the tool get up to speed, hold it firmly in place with the face and the fence against your stock at the mark you have made, and then plunge it in for a clean cut. One advantage biscuits have over dominoes is that there's a little side to side play, so if your alignment is off by a bit it doesn't really matter. The glue up for these parts is pretty simple. A dab of glue on one set of biscuit slots and a bead of glue on the other edge and once that's spread evenly, you can add the biscuits to either side and then press the two pieces together. In this case, where I have a three-piece glue up, I just repeat the process again. Then it's a matter of tapping and clamping things in place and wiping off the excess glue and setting things aside to dry. Once the glue had dried, it was time to plane things smooth. With this design, I chose to do the subtop partially in solid oak and the other side in plywood. The plywood is lighter, less expensive, and I've got a lot of it kicking around. And I also think it'll help keep the subtop more stable. A few passes through my planer in the solid oak section was the same thickness as the 18mm plywood. I also made a cheat strip to hide the end of the plywood on the exposed end. And while I know this isn't normal, I ran my stock against the grain through the planer so it would be the same size as the long grain stock. I made a point to keep this piece long in case anything went sideways, which surprisingly it did not. After adjusting the depth of cut on my biscuit joiner, I could cut the slots to attach my solid oak sections to its plywood mate. Here again I used the same 8 inch spacing for my biscuits. With that done it was glue, biscuit, and clamp as before. Once the two large pieces were glued together, I could add my little cheater piece that I again had been prepared with biscuit slots. I don't have clamps over five feet long, but I did find some pipe connectors at the big box store so I could connect two pieces of the three quarter inch pipe together and make a clamp long enough for this situation. I added a parallel clamp to pull in the other side and set this all aside to dry. While that was drying, I could start to work on the top. All the edges of this stock were a little wonky. For a few pieces, I had to draw a straight line, cut close to that line with my jigsaw, 
and then reset my straight edge to get a clean edge with my router and pattern bit. With a straight edge on each board, I can now rip the stock to manageable pieces around 3 inches wide. Before I did, I marked the face of each board so I would know the grain pattern for the next step. While I was at the table saw, I ripped down two pieces of stock that I'll use as the glass rail trim pieces later. Again, since I don't have a jointer, yet, I cleaned up the edges of my stock by running them through the planer. This is not the preferred method, but again it works for now. A light pass or two on each side, and the saw marks are gone, leaving me a clean edge for the glue-up. Now it was time to lay out the boards and determine the best grain match for the top. Here you can see the marks I had added before ripping. Now I can flip one board from each pair, and this will help remove some of the bowing and twisting in the boards. It's hard to see with the ends painted, but I made sure to alternate the grain direction on the end grain, one facing up, the next facing down, and so on, again to help minimize any warping later. I laid out the locations for my biscuits as before. Again, dominoes or dowels would work here, but as I mentioned, biscuits are more forgiving and I've been using them for decades. Before gluing up, it's worth it to check your slots for any burrs that you may have created. Sometimes you can just remove them with your finger, while others may need a knife or a chisel. With the clamps in place, it's time for glue. Like before, add glue to each slot and along one edge, Add your biscuits, squeeze or tap your pieces together. Repeat this as necessary until all your stock is assembled. Then you can add clamps to hold things together while the glue sets up. The total width of this top is too wide for my planer, so I split the glue up into two sections. The last thing I did was to wipe off as much of the excess glue as I could to make the cleanup easier later. Once this half of the top had time to dry, I repeated the process for the other half. A couple of passes through the thickness planer on each side and the faces are smooth and reduced to the correct thickness to match the rabbit in the bar rail that you can see here. Because I had already cut the slots for the biscuits on these boards, I made sure to run them the same number of passes on each face to keep the slots aligned. A better plan would have been to cut these last slots after planing, but sometimes I get ahead of myself. The glue up of these two pieces is just like before glue, biscuit, clamp, with one small exception. Since the stock is to its final thickness and oak is an open grain wood, I don't wipe off the excess glue here. It could get smeared into the pores and show up as blotches during the finishing process. Instead, I let it set for an hour or so, and then scrape off any excess glue squeeze out before it gets too hard. No matter how hard I try, my glue ups always have some height deviations at the joint. To clean it up, I start by marking the joint with a pencil and sand the joint smooth until the pencil is gone in both sides of the joint. Just be careful to work wide areas so you don't dish out one side or the other. I'm not a fan of belt sanders, but when used carefully, they can help this process. Although I don't like to use them on anything softer than oak because one misstep can ruin a project. Again, be super careful to keep the tool moving. I like to use diagonal movements to span the joint that needs to be cleaned up and follow that by sanding with the grain. I always come back with a random orbit sander to make sure that I can clean up any belt sander marks. Look carefully as you work because any scratches you miss here will jump out at you when you add finish later. I use my framing square to lay out the first cross cut on the top. Then I could clamp on my shop made saw guide and cut the end square. After double and triple checking my measurements, I cut the opposite end the same way. I could say that careful planning allowed me to trim both ends without exposing any biscuits, but dumb luck is probably more truthful. Because of the weight of this top, I chose to cut it with my Craig rip cut rather than wrestle it across my smallish table saw. The side I'm cutting off will be buried in the bar rail, so I wasn't overly concerned with having to stop midway to adjust my clamps. There was a small deviation on that edge, but it was minimal, and again, it's going to be hidden. I marked out the location of the upper top on the subtop, and spread glue out along the oak-to-oak -oak portion of the assembly. 
Then I place the top onto the subtop and check the offset of the two sides that the bar rail would cover. When I was happy with the location, I added a couple of clamps and screwed the two pieces together with one and a quarter inch flathead screws. While the glue was drying on the top, I grabbed the strips of trim that I'd cut earlier and resaw them to 9 16 of an inch wide at the table saw. Rather than force the entire cut in one pass, I set the blade height to just over halfway. Then I could rip one side, flip it end for end, and complete the cut on the second pass. Back at the planer, I could clean up the strips with a few passes, leaving me with two strips at a half inch thick by an inch and a quarter wide. I set my router table up with a quarter inch roundover bit, and in two passes created a full roundover on my trim. This would become the drip edge for the glass rail, but don't worry, this will all make sense in a few minutes. Before fitting the trim and moldings, I decided to clean up the end grain on the top assembly. A flush trim bit in my palm router, and the two edges were nice and smooth. On one end of the bar, the trim is flush with the bar side. For the drip edge to look right, I had to remove a section of the glass rail. After laying out the size of the drip edge, I cut out most of the stock with my jigsaw. Then I set up two straight edges along my lines that I could follow with my pattern bit. A few taps on the chisel was all it took to square up that corner. I decided to mount the bar rail before fitting the drip edge, so we'll come back to this later. Earlier I had cut off a section of the bar rail that was more than long enough for the short side. Now that it's time to cut the miters on the end, I realize that the bottom of the rail is angled, which would throw off my miters if I didn't make the cut square to the rabbits for the top assembly. I tacked a piece of half inch and three quarter inch plywood together with a few pin nails to support the stock squarely on the miter saw. Then I could set the stock in the miter saw with the blade set at 45 degrees and clamp it in place so it wouldn't shift during the cut. I took several passes to cut through the stock and yes, I found one of the 23 gauge pin nails mid-cut. Luckily these pins are really small and despite the fireworks, did virtually no damage to the blade. He says, hopefully. The long section of rail was cut in the same way, but with the opposite miter. Now this molding is longer than my miter station is long, so I had to move my saw to the shop floor for this cut. And yes, this time I knew where the pin nails were. My plan was to join the two pieces of rail using biscuits. I marked the location on the underside of both pieces, and then cut the two slots in each rail. One slot was high and the other was low. These locations kept the biscuits in the thickest part of the rail, and I think added a little bit more stability to the joint. With a joinery cut, I could set the two pieces of bar rail in place and mark the square ends to be cut to length. While I think I could have done without the support stock on the square cut, I didn't want to risk it. A few trips to the miter saw and the pieces fit just right. I cut a fill strip that would just fit the underside of the bar rail. This will fill the void between the glass rail and the bar rail where the two come together. Now I can trim that piece to size so it too fits snugly in place and even with the end of the bar rail. It was glued in place and when the glue dried, sanded smooth. It was time to assemble the rail. Because of the complexity of this glue up, I did a few dry runs before adding glue. When I did apply the glue, I made sure to coat both sections of the rail as end grain can suck up glue and starve the joint if you don't use enough. I also made sure to get a little glue on the biscuits so they would adhere to the rails. And despite my practice runs, this glue up was still challenging to get everything in place and the joint nice and tight. While the glue was drying, I laid out mounting holes on the underside of the top. I marked the line half the distance of the first overhang, then came back and marked the screw spacing. With that done, I came back with a taper bit and countersink in my drill and pre-drilled all the mounting holes. The last step was to sand off the lines and any burrs created during this process. Once the glue was dry and after a bit of sanding, it was time to connect the bar rail to the top. I set the rail on the top and then used a couple of clamps to hold it in place. 
Working a couple of holes at a time, I used the same taper bit and drilled through the holes I just put into the top up into the rail. Then I fastened the two together with some number 8 by inch and a half screws, working my way down the entire length of the rail and around the corner. It's time to get back to the drip edge on the glass rail. For trim like this, where there's one square end, I like to start with a clean miter and then cut the stock to size by trimming the square end. I think this makes things easier and leads to cleaner cuts. With a short piece of drip edge cut to the proper length, I could tape it in place and measure the distance between it and the bar rail on the opposite end. A few more trips to the miter saw to sneak up on my length and the two pieces of drip edge were ready to install. A little glue and a few 23 gauge pin nails held the small drip edge in place. I made sure to line up the bottom of the drip edge to the bottom of the glass rail as best I could. The long drip edge went on much the same way, except I used a few clamps to hold things while I pinned it in place. This piece had a little twist to it and gave me a bit of a fight, but I finally got it in place and added some clamps until the glue had a chance to dry. With all the trim in place, the entire assembly got a good sanding, starting at 120 grit up through 220 grit with my random over sander. I like my pieces to have sharp looking edges, but not so sharp they'll cut you. To get this look, I used my sander with 220 grit paper, and with a few passes, I eased all the square edges. Once all the surfaces were sanded and the square edges had been eased, there were a few curved edges that needed a little attention as well. I wanted that same look and feel, but on these shapes, it's best to work by hand. I used some 220 grit paper and eased all the edges, then gave them one last pass with the grain to ensure there were no cross grain scratches. After blowing off all the dust and making sure to clean out as much of the open grain as possible, I moved the top inside for finishing. I managed to avoid sweating on the top during the final sanding, and a storm was brewing, and I didn't want to have my freshly stained top getting rain spots. I started by staining the bottom, then I flipped it over and stained the top. I'm using a basic oil stain here to match my client's flooring. The stain is easy to apply. You just wipe it on, make sure you get in all the nooks, joints, and open grain, then wipe off any excess stain. You can work in fairly large areas at one time and then move to the next area. The wood will only absorb so much stain and going over one area a second time won't add any additional color or darkening. Just make sure to wipe off all that excess. I let the stain dry overnight, then it was time for the bar top epoxy. I added three coats to the bottom, let that dry, and then it was time for the show face. I learned a few lessons while coating the bottom. One is that my shop is too hot and humid, so naturally I moved the bar into the house to coat the top. I followed the manufacturer's instructions on mixing the epoxy, and when it was thoroughly mixed, I poured the first coat. This is just a fill coat, and I wasn't going for any real depth. I was just trying to fill all the grain and voids in the surface. Since this is self-leveling epoxy, I took the time to ensure that the top was level side to side and front to back. Products like this are great when your project is a flat surface, but the curves and insets made this pour a bit more challenging. I used a plastic scraper and a foam brush to get as even a coat as possible on all surfaces. The other challenge with this pour is I'm working with red oak and open grained wood. The more porous your material is, the more likely you are to get air bubbles as the epoxy sets. I used a handheld butane torch to bring the bubbles to the surface so they can be released. This is most notable on the first pour and I used my torch repeatedly until the epoxy had set enough that the wood could not release any more air. Oh, and keep that torch moving. You want enough heat to draw out the bubbles, but not enough to burn the epoxy. The subsequent pours were done the same way. Mix, pour, smooth, and remove the bubbles. I know there are people out there who can get a smooth pour, but apparently I'm not one of them. Maybe there was something I missed or a trick I don't know but I ended up with lots of dips and drips. After a little sanding, oh, okay, a lot of sanding, the worst of the high spots were removed. The shiny spots you can see after the sanding are the lower areas, and I hope to fill those with urethane. 
With all the curved surfaces and tight spaces, there was quite a bit of hand sanding as well. With the sanding complete, it was time for finish. I laid down three coats of oil-based spar varnish, sanding at 220 grit between coats. Then I could flip the top and do the same finish. Several coats later, and all the low spots from the pour were nicely filled, but I couldn't get the varnish to flow out the way I'd liked. After checking for compatibility with the manufacturer, I sanded the spar varnish again and sprayed the top with a few coats of water-based urethane. I've always had good luck with this product, and I finally got a nice finish. I wanted to give it a little more polish, so I wet sanded the entire top. I started with 300 grit, then 400, 600, and finished with 1000. This gave me a smooth finish, removing any imperfections from the spraying. I finished the top with a couple of coats of paste wax. I simply rubbed it on, making my last pass with the grain, and let it sit for about 15 minutes. Then I could buff it out, again working with the grain until all the wax was removed. The installation went smoothly. We carried in the body of the bar, the top, and the foot rail. I started by attaching the bar top to the top frame of the base with some number 8 by 2 inch screws. Then I attached the foot rail to the bar. I used quarter 20 machine head screws that I had painted black to match the foot rail and locked them in place with washers and acorn nuts that I had painted white. It's a little detail, but the fasteners blend in with the bar. This build was full of challenges. It was big, it was heavy, and the thought of messing up that bar rail just scared the crap out of me. And I had several setbacks during the finishing process, but that's a story for another day. When it was all said and done, it came together nicely, and my clients were thrilled with how it turned out. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this process. Were there things I could have done differently, smarter, easier? Drop them in the comments below. I'd love to hear. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a thumbs up and share it with friends. And if you haven't already, maybe it's time to hit that subscribe button and the little bell so you get notified each time I put out a new video. As always, I never know what's going to come up next, so you'll have to stay tuned and find out. Guys, have a great day. Take care, and we'll see you soon.